All right, let's get started right now with news you can use. Today, we're going to do the first part of a two-part series called Cities That Win. We talk a lot about what's been going on in the economy, what's going on specifically in the housing industry, how interest rates are adversely affecting, of course, the business, the market as a whole, and how it's uh, going to hurt the economy, the fact that we're having higher interest rates, inflation, so on and so forth. But there's a bright spot in this, and there was a bright spot in the last downturn. But first, I want to roll back the clock a little bit, tell you a little bit about uh, when I was a senior in college, I, I had designed my program so that I get out exactly four years. And <clears throat> I went in at the end of four years to fill out the paperwork to get my diploma. And I realized, or they told me, that I had missed one class that I needed to have uh, in order to get my bachelor's degree. And I blanked it out, but it was a class that I had a intentionally avoided going to because I didn't think it'd be worth anything and I thought it would just frankly just be boring and it was statistics and so I ended up having to basically stay that fall semester for one class in order to get my degree and I I initially I hated the class and it was being taught by this little old lady uh, you know we called her the crypt keeper she probably you know at the time was younger than I am now but nonetheless she um she was awesome. And she, I was struggling in a class and she gave me some extra help. But one day she told me to come by later on after school and meet her in her classroom. And she, she taught me the basic premise of stats. And she showed me why statistics were very important. And she said something that's very, very important to me. She said, do you realize that all the millionaires in the world, the one thing they have in common isn't good sales. It's not people skills, it's not that they've invented something, it's that they all understand statistics to a certain degree or another. They understand how what's going on out there in the world, or their marketplace, or with their product, or with their production, all of it goes back to statistics. And so that's what I want to talk about the next two weeks. This week, and uh, actually this week and probably Thursday, we'll do this again, the other half of this thing. I want to talk about how you can look at statistics and you can determine in advance uh, how history repeats itself. Everybody's heard that terminology for a long time. History does repeat itself. What's happened in the past will happen in the future. Uh, and if you understand the past from a statistics standpoint, you understand the factors that led up to that, you're going to be able to look for those factors in the future and see what's going to happen. So in the housing market, and I have to give a shout out to both Bruce Norris and Nick Gurley uh, with ReVenture Consulting. These guys are probably among the smartest guys in the business in terms of statistical analysis. Um, and a lot of the information I'm gonna give you is, is directly from them. But these guys know what they're talking about. This is what they do for a living is they analyze the stats in the market and they predict. <clears throat> and what uh, the, the collective knowledge here has come up with is there's about 10, uh, uh, there's gonna be 10 cities I'm gonna talk about specifically that are going to win this thing. Um, and in some of the factors, let's just talk about, we'll run down through some of the factors that make a difference It's the cities that will win in a downturn versus majority of the cities that will lose. Uh, first, first concept is migration. Uh, there's both national and local migration you need to look at. So national, on a national basis, it would be people moving from one area of the country to another. Saw a lot of this happening during COVID, during the lockdown, a lot of people moved out. Uh, you also have political issues. People, for example, in California, at least 2 million people, 2 million Republicans have moved out of California in the last year and a half and moved to other states that they don't want to have to deal with uh, the, the strong blue politics we've got here in California. Um, and a good example of migration, if you follow that, you'll see where those people go. Uh, typically, people that move out of California have money, um, and it usually goes further in other areas. So one of the biggest areas uh, that people have moved to the last couple of years is from California to Nashville, Tennessee. So you look at Nashville and you say, well, that's going to be a good one because people are still moving out of California. They still like Tennessee. They like Florida, Texas, Idaho. They moved to Utah. A lot of these places that have blown up, Austin, Texas, a lot of these places that have blown up is because of people have migrated from the West to the East uh, to get out of the political environment and for other reasons, basically cost of living and things like that. Uh, but then when you dig down and you go from, you know, a national look at uh, migration, you look at local migration. And when you dig deep and you uncover, you will see that people are moving in masses from Nashville 
to Knoxville, Tennessee. It's about two and a half hours away on drive. Um, and, and the main thing is because Knoxville is not only just a beautiful place to live and has got a lot of space and you get, you know, the, all the, the things that we've talked about in previous episodes here is the places you want to look at. But the cost of housing is tremendously less. So the average price right now in Nashville is 465, 465,000. In uh, Knoxville, it's about 300,000. Same house, three hours away, two hours, two and a half hours away. So one of the winners, for example, <clears throat> will be Knoxville. It's an area where people are going to either migrate directly into or people are going to move to from, you know, other places they've just moved to, like Nashville, then to Knoxville. So <clears throat> that's an idea that we need to follow up. Another one that would fit that same category, uh, people are moving from Atlanta to Birmingham, Alabama. Fairly close, similar demographics, uh, but it's less than half to live the cost to live in Birmingham, Alabama, as it is from Atlanta. So if you look at these things as a whole, without knowing, digging deep within the statistics underneath, you, you won't have any idea as to why this is happening. But Birmingham, Alabama, Knoxville, Tennessee, those would be two on my list. Third thing we want to look at is affordability. <clears throat> Pure, is it just cheap to live there? Right? Overall, cost of housing, cost of living. Uh, a, a good example of this is Oklahoma City. In uh, Oklahoma City, uh, you can get a brand new 2,500, 3,000 square foot, three, four bedroom, two, three bath house uh, for less than $300,000, 289,000 probably is the average for that kind of house. And you're a half a mile from Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, you know, some of the, the higher end, higher scale places that people like to be close to. Um, and you can't do that. For, to do something like that in California, it'd be still north of a million dollars type thing. But you've got more, more area and that kind of stuff. The economy's good. Uh, the oil business, <clears throat> even though it's costing us a ton of money for gas, is good. Um, and so Oklahoma City would make my list in terms of affordability. There's also a factor called ownership advantage. Now, ownership advantage is kind of a unique concept. Ownership advantage says, is it cheaper to own or is it cheaper to rent? In California, the answer is very clear. It's much cheaper to rent than it is to own. Mortgage payment uh, for, you know, some of these big, you know, for right now for a million dollar house would be six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month. You can rent these things for two, three, thirty five hundred dollars a month. So, it's much cheaper to rent than it is to own California. Always have it, it. Basically, most of my adult life, it has been cheaper to, uh, to, to rent than to own in California, regardless of whether it's a high or low interest rate. Um, <clears throat> but if you look the other direction and you look where, where it is literally cheaper to own than it is to rent, there's some unique areas out there. One of them, and in, in terms of disclosure, this is one that I invest in heavily and have for years. Uh, is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The average cost of rent, Pittsburgh's $1,500. The average cost today, if you were to buy that same house at top of the market and pay 8% interest, is $1,200. So you would save $300 by owning, even at an 8% mortgage rate, and still uh, save money and have tax deductibility vis-a-vis -vis the home ownership aspect. So there are some towns and some cities Remember, there's 50 states, there's 350 approximately MSAs, Metropolitan Statistical Areas. This is like a realtor's group. There's 3,000 plus counties in the U.S. There's all kinds of areas of the country where there are golden gems that you just don't know about. Now, they're, they're not going to be New York City, Los Angeles, you know, Dallas. It's going to be some of these smaller, a little bit smaller cities, that kind of thing. But these some of these things give you an amazing advantage as a real estate investor. And then the, the uh, one of the things you can look back to is um, the last housing crisis. So during the last housing crisis, now that went from 2007, was basically the peak. Think of fall 2007 exactly like today. It's just like fall 2022. Normally these things run on 14 year cycles. We're at a 15 year cycle. We're a year extended because of the year we took a knee during COVID. So it's 15 years ago exactly uh, since we had the peak of the market. Everybody thinks the peak was six. It was actually summer, fall of seven, and then stuff started to really drop. And it really it didn't hit bottom. It literally didn't get to the bottom until 12. 
So the last housing crisis was to, nationally was, and there's differences geographically, regionally, that kind of thing, but generally 2007 to 2012. So when you look at the, the peak of the market to the trough of the market, that five year period, uh, there's some tremendous, you know, there were some big losses. So Phoenix, for example, dropped 30, uh, 53% during that seven to 12 period, 53%. The average house when it started was 292,000 in Phoenix. At the bottom in 2012, that, price, that same exact house dropped 136,000. So it dropped over half. Uh, Miami, Florida dropped 32% during that five year period of time. It went from 338,000 to an average of 162,000. Once again, over a 50% drop. And uh, Atlanta, for example, dropped 35%. The average home, 2007, peak of the market, 203,000. And at the bottom in 2012, it became $131,000. So those are the extremes. Those are things where um, you know, the worst case scenario, are we going to see drops like that? in parts of this country over the next several years, absolutely. From our peak a couple of months, a few months ago to the bottom, uh, there's gonna be some areas that are 50% uh, drop. There are some that are running at about 4% a month right now, to do the math, four times 12, 48, 48%. Won't last that long. That, I mean, I don't think it's gonna go that quick, but I don't think this top to bottom is gonna take five years either. I think it's gonna be shorter. That said, there are a number of cities that from seven to 12 went up, believe it or not, they actually went up. So let me give you an example. And this will be one of the ones that I, once again, interest of disclosure, uh, I said, I'm investing in that. I'm rehabbing in this market now. I own rentals and have for probably since 2005 and six. <clears throat> city of Pittsburgh. Uh, city of Pittsburgh during the last housing downfall went from an average sale price at the beginning, 118,000, to the end, 122,000. It's not a lot, 4% increase, uh, but that is a significant amount. When other cities are losing 50% of their value, Pittsburgh went up 4%. It's gonna do the same thing again. It didn't go up these tremendous things, these tremendous levels, like a lot of these cities did uh, over the last 15 years, but it has grown steadily. And it's going to continue to grow steadily, in my opinion. Oklahoma City is another one. It, it started the um, it, it started the bottom, the top of the the last peak, 2007, 126 thousand dollars is where it started. At the end, Oklahoma City was 128, two percent increase, a little less than two percent. It's not a huge amount, nonetheless. In that five year period, it went up. Safe investment, very safe investment in those two cities. Um, okay, so the last one I want to talk about is positive migration. And I've, I've gone through that. I did four or five cities there. They're going to be on my list. I'm going to talk about a couple more, and then we're going to finish up next, next session with the top three and some unusual things I want to tell you about in a second. Positive migration, just <clears throat> areas that people for a long period of time want to move to. So we're having this COVID surge, Californians leaving. It's been like three and a half million uh, Californians have left. Uh, less than a million people have moved in over the last two years. The first time since we were a state uh, in, in 1850, or the, the 49ers, as they call them, 1849s, when basically the U.S. started taking control of California. It's the first time in the last two years that we've actually lost population. Believe it or not. We've gone down two years in a row, and it's because of net migration out. Now, that's a one-time thing, right? <clears throat> Two years out of 170 years, that's, that would be like, you know, a storm of the century type deal. There are cities, believe it or not, that have gone up every year, good economies, bad economies, inflation, no inflation. They've gone up for a long period of time. There's one in particular uh, that if you look at the stats, will tell you that it's gone up 31 years in a row. Population has increased, good or bad, 31 years in a row. And that city is Indianapolis, Indiana. That is one of the ones. Once again, disclosure, I, I don't have any properties there today, but I've owned rentals there for a long period of time, off and on. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Indianapolis uh, has a, a factor, a statistical factor that, that will root for it to continue to hold its value or to increase 
during this downturn because of positive migration. Another one that <clears throat> uh, is on the list uh, is uh, has gone up for 15 years in a row. 15 years, the population has increased. This is the only city in this particular state that I'm gonna tell you about where the population has literally increased on a year over year basis, 15 years in a row. That city is Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. That's also on my list, Harrisburg, PA. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Harrisburg gone up 15 years in a row. That's a safe bet because people want to live there. They wanna live there in good markets. They wanna live there in bad markets. They wanna live in all kinds of markets. And that is the absolute kind of place to be, in my opinion. Now, next week or later this week, we're going to talk about some other factors. We're going to talk about low home building. Uh, there are a million and a half units of homes being built right at this time. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Just getting over bronchitis. Um, there are a low number of home building uh, areas in the country. And there are some areas that are just off the chain. Uh, they've got more homes and there's literally going to be housing surplus in these markets. So I'll give you one right now. This is one I would not invest in, one that is certainly a danger. Uh, and it's been on my list of biggest market crashes, uh, Austin, Texas. If you're in Austin, Texas, and you own a $600,000 home, expect that dude to be worth three fifty dollars by the time we get through this thing. So, you know, you don't, if you're going to, I mean, I was talking to some buddies the other day. I said, is there a way, a real good way to short the housing market? Because with stats now and the fact that we've got this technology that we didn't even have 15 years ago, we can literally be able to go in and determine what the winners are and the, and the, and the losers. It is, it is amazing when you look at these stats, but there's almost no way that what I'm telling you won't happen. I'm not... Don't, don't take me my money to the bank, but I'm taking my money to the bank and, and I'm betting on a number of these cities. So we're gonna look at that next time. We're gonna look at areas, uh, you know, like Austin that are having uh, big problems because they've got more homes than they have people who wanna live there, more homes than they have people who can afford. Here in California, <clears throat> where I'm originally from in central California, um, I think I showed you guys a few months ago, there was a building development they started uh, a year and a half ago at 600, and it was a high 600s. And now those same homes are selling for the low, for the high 300s, low 400s. And the problem that a lot of these home builders have is they have too high of a cost of goods sold because of inflation. So when they get done with the house, they may have 500 in it, but the house may be only worth 450. So there's gonna be a glut of homes. What happens? Well, you're gonna see new homes go on sale cheap. And that's going to make it difficult for other home buyers to sell. But there are areas of the country, like I said, we'll talk about in the next episode, uh, where the opposite is true. There has not been enough home building going on. There is a shortage of homes. And you add that to a combination of one of these other factors, primarily migration into the area, and just what we call positive migration, people wanting to live there, and going there and figuring out I'm gonna live, I'm gonna move there and I don't care, I'll figure a place to live. Those things have housing shortages and they're not only are the home prices gonna go up in my opinion, but rents are gonna go up now. All of you guys know by now, the rents have peaked. Nobody's getting, except you've got a few greedy landlords out there still asking for, for more money. But if you just signed a rent contract for the next year, I guarantee you a year from now, you're gonna get that thing cheaper if you wanna negotiate it because there's gonna be more product on the market and everybody wants to live in a rental home. There's a big demand, but there's gonna be more supply than there is demand. So anyway, that's it. It's a little long, way long, sorry, 20 minutes <coughs> on our news you can use today, but we'll get to section two next week. And I'm gonna tell you about the number one city in my opinion. Um, and it is a city that is paying right now, is paying $10,000 to any person that has a remote business, and wants to come live in that city. They're giving you 10,000 cash. Those are the cities that are gonna spike during this next four or five year period of time. All right, everybody, thanks a lot. That's it for news you can use for today. Stay tuned for episode two next time.